This will be a very short lecture on eye movements because we've covered a lot of this um, in previous lectures, but I mainly want to tie in the cerebral cortex and eye movements. All right, so we're up to the cortical um, area now on our trip through the nervous system. And so I want to emphasize mainly the frontal eye fields and eye movements, and we'll make a number of relevant, I think, high-yield clinical applications of that. So remember that um, when we look at the lateral surface of the brain, we have the cortical spinal tract here, uh, which this kind of very crude drawing just illustrates that here the left um, cortical spinal tract is going to cross here in the lower medulla to supply anterior horn cells that move muscles in your right arm and leg. Okay, here is the um, frontal eye field area, or sometimes called the saccadic gaze center. Um, a saccad is a quick eye movement. Okay, this is on the middle frontal gyrus, and so the left frontal eye fields always want to push your eyes to the right. Okay, not shown in the diagram is there are right frontal eye fields that always want to push your eyes to the left. So normally they are equally counterbalanced. So how does how does the left frontal eye field area move your eyes to the right? Well, it activates the opposite pons PPRF six nerve complex. Okay, and so the six nerve is going to activate the lateral rectus to move the right eye to the right, and via the MLF medial longitudinal fasciculus. This activates the third nerve nucleus to supply the medial rectus, so now the left eye moves to the right. Okay, so that's how the left brain moves the eyes to the right, and also we can see uh, the adjacent area will move your right arm and leg. Okay, so the clinical applications, there are several really important ones. First of all, if we have a middle cerebral artery stroke, which is going to affect this whole area because the middle cerebral artery supplies most of the lateral hemisphere of the brain. All right, so if we have a left MCA stroke, we know that the patient is going to have weakness on the right side of the body. Okay, so we'll have a right hemiplegia. Okay, which way will the eyes look? Well, if we've destroyed the area of the brain that wants to move your eyes to the right, then the right frontal eye fields are now relatively overactive and so the eyes will get pushed to the left. All right, so with a left MCA stroke, um, if we imagine here the patient is looking at us, they're going to have, or I'm sorry, is looking at the screen, um, so they're going to have right arm and leg weakness, and the eyes will be looking to the left. And review books usually say the eyes look at the stroke, um, which is, I suppose, helpful. But I think it's more useful uh, to remember that the eyes look away from the hemiplegia. Okay, that's what we see in an MCA stroke. And the reason I think that's more helpful is when you're walking into the emergency room to see a patient who's had a stroke, um, you don't have a brain scan yet. You don't know where the stroke is. So if the eyes are looking away from the hemiplegia, you know that that almost certainly has to be a middle cerebral artery stroke. Now we need to make some applications of this. Let's say we have a lesion in the pons, here in the right pons. Okay, so here's the cortical spinal tract now drawn on the other side. And so, of course, this hasn't crossed yet, right? So if we have a lesion in the right pons, the patient will have left-sided weakness. Now which way will the eyes look? And to answer that question, you just need to ask yourself, what does the right pons normally do? Well, it normally wants to move the eyes to the right via the six nerve lateral rectus and via the crossing pathway over here to the medial rectus. So if you knock out this area which wants to move the eyes to the right, then the other PPRF six nerve complex, which isn't drawn but is on this side, is now rel relatively overactive. And now we can see that a lesion in the right pons will cause the eyes to go to the left. Okay, so now this patient with a right pontine lesion has left-sided weakness, and the eyes look at the hemiplegia. Okay, so if we see that, now we know we're dealing with a pontine stroke or hemorrhage or some other uh, structural lesion there. All right, another application. What happens if we have a seizure that originates from the left hemisphere? Well, um, you now a seizure, of course, is the opposite of a stroke. Now we have excessive electrical activity. We drive pathways rather than you know, destroy them. 
And so if we activate the precentral gyrus here in the left hemisphere, in a seizure, the right arm and leg will shake. If we activate the left frontal eye fields, now we stimulate this pathway, which is going to activate the opposite PPRF6 nerve complex, and the eyes will get driven to the right. So in a seizure, the eyes will look at the shaking arm and leg. And I've seen this several times where you just happen to witness a patient have a seizure. And uh, so the eyes looking at the shaking arm and leg will tell you which hemisphere of the brain is active in the seizure activity. All right, and another um, clinical application is if we have a lesion here of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. So the MLF you just want to associate with um, allowing the eyes to move together when we, in, uh, when we test horizontal eye movements or when the patient is just looking from side to side. And so it activates the part of the third nerve nucleus that talks to the medial rectus. So if a patient has a left MLF lesion, okay, then the problem is going to be when you ask that patient to look to the right because the right eye is going to move out no problem, but the left eye will either get stuck in the midline or it will move more slowly. Okay, so here now the patient is looking at us with a left MLF lesion, so the eyes look conjugate um, at baseline. When the patient looks to the left, no problem, because um, when the patient looks to the left here, the sixth nerve, lateral rectus, is fine, and so the eyes work together, but when the patient now tries to look to the right, the medial rectus muscle um, isn't working here. So the right eye is normal, it looks out okay, but the left eye gets stuck in the midline. And what you will usually see in that situation is that the normal right eye will shake back and forth. That's called nystagmus. And this is the attempt of the brain to try to bring the images together. Okay. And so um, oftentimes it's not that obvious. It isn't that the eye just gets stuck in the midline. It's that it moves more slowly towards the nose. And so the best way really to check, um, pick this up is to hold up your pen and your finger and you ask the patient to look back and forth, pen, finger, pen, finger. And that really assesses these quick saccadic eye movements. And that's when you'll usually see this eye just moving more slowly towards the nose, along with some nystagmus here. Now, what isn't really shown in this diagram is that the MLF pathways are very close together in the midline. And so what we often see in multiple sclerosis is that we'll have a demyelinating lesion here that will affect bilateral MLF pathways. Okay, and so um, a bilateral MLF lesion um, is called a, a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Um, here we have a unilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The name just means internuclei. It's between PPRF and 3, and ophthalmoplegia is just a big name for an eye movement problem. Okay, but a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia is just really highly suggestive of multiple sclerosis. And even if we just see a unilateral MLF lesion, INO, um, again, in a young patient, you would still think multiple sclerosis. Now, um, in the coma lecture, we'll talk about cold calorics and the vestibular ocular reflex and how all of that activates um, movement of the eyes. But for this picture, I just wanted to point out that um, here we have the MLF on both sides. Okay, these are all of the third nerve um, nuclei. And the, in purple here, we have the part of the third nerve that supplies the medial rectus. Here we can see the third nerve coming out here to the medial rectus. And uh, there is a convergence nucleus here that when you, um, if you follow a pen to your nose, that's convergence. And that is preserved in patients that have MLF lesions. Okay, so the patient, when you ask them to look from side to side, if the lesion's here, well, then, you know, that medial rectus isn't going to work. The eye isn't going to look to the nose. But if you ask the patient to look to their nose, both eyes together look to the nose just fine. So convergence is preserved in patients with MLF lesions. Okay, so if this works, I want to just show a video of a patient who has a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So we've taken out the distance here between, um, you know, the eyes. And so kind of look right here when you watch this video 
And what you'll appreciate is that neither eye moves to the nose very well. The abducting eye uh, always works better, and then we'll see some nystagmus in the abducting eye. Okay. Now, um, lesions above the brain stem will always, if they affect eye movements, the eyes will still always be conjugate, like in a gaze preference. Okay, we don't, that doesn't cause a disconjugate gaze. Lesions of the brain stem or of the individual cranial nerves will result in eye movement, eyes that don't line up together. That's a disconjugate gaze. So here's a 12 year old um, boy who's experiencing double vision. And again, double vision, we're not gonna see that with lesions above the brain stem, okay? And so um, here we've got an obvious abnormality here. Now he has right-sided weakness. And what we can see is there's significant ptosis here. We can appreciate the pupil um, is dilated. And we can see perhaps that the eyes here are not lined up. And so when he tries to look up, this eye is not cooperating. Same thing when he looks down. And I wish I had pictures here to show you. Uh, this is a third nerve palsy, of course. And so if you were to ask this boy to look to the left, well, the sixth nerve is working. So this eye would move out quite well. But when looking to the right, the eye wouldn't be able to because the third nerve supplies the medial rectus. Okay, so in a ipsilateral third nerve palsy, contralateral hemiplegia, the lesion would have to be in the left, left midbrain. And that is... Weber's syndrome. Okay, and of course the other thing we'll see is since the third nerve supplies the uh, via the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, the parasympathetic contribution to constrict the pupil, the, um, this eye is not going to constrict to light stimulation. All right, and so I won't say much about this because we've already been over cranial nerves three, four, and six, but uh, if you check eye movements in an H shape, uh, when you have the patient follow their pen, these are the individual eye muscles that you're checking. And just remember that um, most helpful is to remember is SO4 LR6. So all of these eye muscles are supplied by the third nerve, except for the superior oblique and the lateral rectus. Lateral rectus, of course, is abduction of the eye. And superior oblique, this is the one that, that often um, confuses students. Here it is shown as down and in but it is more um, nuanced than that. And so in this um, helpful drawing here, um, for the superior muscles here, we're looking on top of the right eye. For the inferior muscles, we're looking on the um, undersurface. So let's just talk about the superior oblique. So imagine here, we're looking down on the top of the right eye. So here's the nose, the left eye would be over here. And so in primary gaze, what's the function of the superior oblique? Well, we can just kind of see if we get this tugging motion here, we're going to get some encyclotorsion, meaning the eye rotates down and towards the nose. And also it's just going to depress the right eye down and towards the nose. Now, when the eye is in the abducted position, so the patient's looking to the right, notice now because of the action here, because of this pulley here of the superior oblique, that the action of the superior oblique only almost purely is in cyclotorsion. Okay, again, a rot rotatory movement down and towards the nose. Whereas when the right eye is looking towards the nose, now this is the strongest action of the superior oblique, and now it's going to act purely to depress the eye down and towards the nose. Okay, so again, the the rule with the superior oblique is the more the eye is looking towards the nose, it acts to depress the eye. The further the eye is abducting, the more the superior oblique acts just to encyclotort the eye. Okay, and I've previously shown you uh, pictures when we went through the uh, brainstem and cranial nerves of what a fourth nerve palsy looks like. But just to come back here to a third nerve palsy, where often we have complete ptosis, the other picture I showed you, there was a partial third nerve palsy. But if you lift the eyelid up, of course, the eye is going to be in this down and out position. But if the fourth nerve is intact, when you ask this patient to try to look 
this direction to the to the left, if the fourth nerve is intact, we're going to see that in cyclotorsion. Okay, and that tells us that the fourth nerve is intact, and the problem is just with the third nerve palsy.